Hey everyone, Richard here with my friend and fellow author, A.G. Porter. Um, she is one of the writers who I invited into my shared world called Mirrorstone. Uh, there's two anthologies in that series, and uh, it's a bunch of short stories um, by different authors, um, people that I've met and I know, and um, we have themes in each one. And so uh, I'm inviting them to do readings of their stories. Um, uh, hers is a little bit longer, so we're not gonna do the whole story uh, in this video, but we will, um, you will get a, a feel for her writing style and everything. And obviously if you're interested in uh, checking out those anthologies, um, we'll put the links in the um, description. So, and then of course I'll include the links to her website and things like that so you could check out um, her books as well so uh go ahead and tell us about yourself and you know what you write and anything you want to let our fans know sure yeah uh, this is like my least favorite thing to do because i'm very awkward and you'll you'll see that <laughs> but as uh richard said i do write under ag porter which is really weird when people call me AG, because I'm so used to Amanda. So if you want to call me Amanda, it's totally fine. But um, I mostly write uh, YA paranormal. Um, that's kind of like my bread and butter. I've, that's how I started my writing career is YA paranormal. And um, it's probably just something I'm always going, to, that genre is going to be something I always write in. However, I do love fantasy. I've always been a huge uh, fan of fantasy. So when Richard reached out to me and was like, hey, I'm putting together this anthology. Do you want to participate in it? I was like, oh, here's my opportunity. Here's my opportunity to write a fantasy story. I'm so excited. So I jumped at the chance um, to, to dip my toe in. And uh, I'm so glad that he liked the story and accepted it into the amazing world of Mirrorstone. Um, so yeah, I've been writing since 2012, and uh, I have four published novels out, um, a few poetry collections, and I'm currently writing on my fifth um, full-length novel that hopefully will be out next year. It's the second uh, and like the final book is a duology of The Sacrifice of Ava Black, which is my newest uh, young adult novel. And um, yeah, I'm really excited about it. It's kind of like uh, my first, you know, trilogy. I loved it, but the sacrifice of Ava Black is kind of like the story of my heart that I've wanted to write for a long time. So I'm super excited about it. But yeah, that's that's me in a nutshell. Awesome. <laughs> my writing career, anyway. <laughs> yeah. Well, I like it. I think. Uh, I think. Uh, e even though it's paranormal, it kind of borders on fantasy. Mm -hmm. You know, like it's yeah. all kind of like things that aren't in the real world today and you know whatever so i kind of you know there's obviously different subgenres and everything but i kind of lump it all into fantasy so i think uh right for know, sure anyone who likes fantasy and in 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 any way will like you know i think your, your books for sure so um, yeah well awesome well we'll uh let you go ahead and do some reading from your story and sure and uh, yeah let um, them get a taste of your style and and get hooked on it and go check out the anthology <laughs> yeah i want to um preface this with just telling everyone that yes you're going to hear a fantasy story in my southern accent and i'm sorry <laughs> <laughs> <You're fine. laughs> um but you know that's what happens when you're from the south and yeah and we're raised in the small town <laughs> right you get the southern <laughs> accent <laughs> um yeah, this uh, story is called The Armor of Dusan, and um, I'm going to read first couple or first chap first two chapters, I guess, because it is a very long story, as, as Richard said. Human. Those words have been spat in Zana's face since she was a child, as if it were a curse. Her life amongst the fair folk was full of enchantment and wonder, but there was an underlying resentment from those around her. Of course, my tablet goes blank <laughs> as soon as I start reading. While her adoptive family loved her, she knew in her heart she would never truly be one of them. After all, she was only human. Still, her father, Dothran, was a high lord and trained all of his children 
in the ways of Hokesh. It made no difference, he said, what was in her blood. It mattered what was in her heart. She clearly had the heart of a warrior. Move it, little fire, a sharp voice yelled as she hit the ground. You're being outmatched. Zion knew that. Her father had pitted her once again against her oldest sister, Karis. Just as the air returned Zion's lungs, Karis's sword came down towards her head. She only had a moment to stop the blade from severing her head from her shoulders. Anger willed inside her chest and she pushed the sword away with all her strength and somehow made it back to her feet. Are you yielding so soon, little fire? Karis used the nickname like a taunt. Still, Zyanna could see the stunned look on her sister's face. Never, Zyanna small, smiled and lunged forward, swinging wide. She knew that it left her wide open, but the move was so sudden that Karis was surprised. Zyanna's blade came down hard, hitting Karis directly in the shoulder. The sound was loud, metal clanging against metal. It jarred Zyanna and threw her off balance. Karis rounded on her, flipping her over her shoulder. Karis' sword, sword's tip was inches from her throat. Both of them were breathing heavily. That was stupid, Karis gritted her teeth. I bet that shoulder stings, Diana smiled. You gave me your neck so you could get in one feeble blow, Karis growled. Diana shrugged her shoulders and then winced. She knew her body would be sore if she didn't go see the healers. Karis, lower your weapon, Dorthrin said. I should give you just a tiny cut, Karis sneered, to teach her a lesson. Karis, their mother ga gasped. Zyna didn't like it when she came. Ira, her mother, had always been a beauty and was treated as such. Her long blonde hair was nearly as white as her skin. She was delicate and fair, like all of her daughters, except Zyna. Zyna was tall and beautiful in her own way, but she was not an elf. Where the elves were fair skinned, she had a natural golden brown color. Where their hair was blonde, hers was red like fire. And where their eyes were either blue or sea green, she had eyes like a night sky. They were deep and dark, but the light seemed to always find them as if it reflected every star in the universe. All of her sisters, all five of them, including Karis, looked like their mother. The only difference was Karis's body was lean and powerful from the extensive training. She didn't have to do extra classes, but she chose to. She wanted to be in the King's Guard. If she succeeded, she would be the first she-elf to make it. Diana couldn't fault her for her ambition. She knew what it was like wanting something that others said you could never have. In their world, she-elves were great warriors. Still, none of them had been allowed to enter the King's Guard. Even if she hated to admit it, Zyanna knew that if anyone can make it, it would be Karis. Karis glared at her, but then lowered her blade and walked away. Zyanna lay there for just a moment longer and stood to her feet, brushing the dirt from her pants. The, re the arena was rather full today. She glanced around and noticed how Karis's friends were congratulating her. They made sure to look back at Zyanna and sneer. You must control your emotions, Zyanna. Her father came to her side. You will never master the sword if you never master yourself. I don't know why you make me do this, Zyanna sheathed her blade. You know that I am no match for Karis. Zyanna, her father took her face in his hands, making her meet his eyes. I am well aware that you are human, but you are still my daughter, the daughter that I chose. You may not have our strength or our magical inclinations, but you have something all your own, and that is passion. It is your heart. That is one thing that I admire about humans. You must work so much harder for the things you want in life. Once you obtain those goals, it means something. Do not let these things be considered your weakness, for they are your greatest strength. What will be your downfall is not harnessing the abilities you do possess. Yes, Father, Zion told him. I love you, my daughter. He kissed her gently on the forehead. I love you, too. She suddenly wrapped her arms tightly around his waist. She could feel him chuckle and then embrace her in return. Zyanna, her mother, glided to her side. It is time for you to travel. You have much to study in your time away. Zyanna groaned in internally. She enjoyed her lessons at Felkish Academy, but the instructors required that their students wear constricting attire. The girls had to cover their entire bodies and wear fabric on their heads. The males, it was nearly the same, and no one could enter the library with a weapon. Yes, mother, Zyanna said, releasing her father. Go clean up, Ira told her. Karis, you as well. Take your younger sisters with you. Yes, mother. Karis came forward and her sisters followed. 
Zion hesitated for only a moment and then followed the line of girls like a good little gooseling. Velkesh Academy was a great magnificence. It wasn't just a place of knowledge for children. Elves from all over came to study from its many books and learn from its highly trained teachers. It held every book ever written in any language. It was levels upon levels of knowledge. It was a castle, a fortress of immense power if you knew what you were looking for. Each year, Zyanna and her sisters would spend the fall and winter months there working on their studies. Children from all of the upper class elven families were sent there as well. Soon, all five young ladies were cleaned, dressed, and leaving in the family carriage to the school. Zyanna sat beside her youngest sister, Ethan, who had just turned eight. She was spirited and Zyanna loved her deeply. You did well at your match today, Zyanna, East said to her. Thank you, Easton, Zyanna patted her head. Oh, stop that, Easton said, swatting her away. I'm not a little girl anymore. Sure you are, Zyanna tickled her and the young girl laughed. She only got in a hit because Karis got overconfident and Zyanna cheated, CL, the middle sister, chided. I did not cheat, Zyanna rolled her eyes. I, I am not overconfident, Karis defended herself. I think your skills are increasing at an exponential rate, Sofra added. She was the second to the youngest and one of the brightest elves in all Falkesh. It is very interesting. Only a month ago, your swing was wide and a bit wavering. Today, it was more focused and targeted. You had a better control of the weight of the blade and it didn't affect you much. Very impressive. It was not impressive, Karis laughed. She got lucky. It won't happen again. I'm telling you, she cheated. She did not cheat, Ethan argued. This went on for a while, but Zyanna decided not to join in. She didn't care if they thought she cheated. She also didn't care if Karis thought she got lucky. What made her sit and ponder was what Sofra had said. Her skills were increasing. Of course she had trained for years, but her level of abilities paled in comparison to Karis's. It was unlikely that she would have become that much better in just a month's time. What could have changed since then? Upon their arrival, Zyanna's younger sisters were escorted away by their teachers. Karis would be finished with her studies at the end of term, so she had her own class as well. Zyanna had another year, which meant she had to venture to the fifth level. The fifth level was dedicated to the study of Elkish history. There were bits of history taught to them in levels one through four, but the fifth level left nothing out. Zyanna took her seat at her study table and opened the history book to the place she had marked the previous day. Her instructor, Avra, was at the front of the room, writing an assignment on the board. You're bleeding, someone said to her. Zyanna looked over at her best friend, Javid. His twinkly blue eyes also had an air of mischief to them. She tried not to jump out of her seat and hug him in front of everyone. He had been gone the past year, recruited to the King's Guard early. Zyna didn't think they would let him return to finish his studies. You're back, she said, and you're still bleeding, he smiled. She looked down at her hand. A scratch she thought had stopped bleeding was still a bit raw. It's just a scratch, she shrugged. When did you return? Last night, he said. And you didn't come to see me? She felt slightly affronted. David meant so much to her, more than anyone in her life. There was a moment when she wanted that to mean something more, but she quickly pushed it away. He was an elf and she was human after all. It was late, he laughed, the sound making her feel more at home. I'm sure you would have been asleep. That's never stopped you before, she punched him. David waved across the room. Two girls from a ruling class giggled. One was a former fling of David's, Anessa. Zyanna tried not to let it bother her. Oh, I see, she said. You were busy. No, I... He turned to her, but then instructor Avra began the class, putting an end to their conversation. Their assignment was a bit different today. They were actually leaving the classroom and searching the shelves. You must learn to use the library to its fullest potential, instructor Aver told them. Swords and bows can only help you so much. Your mind is your greatest weapon. We are using the library today. Zion and Javid began looking through the shelves for their assigned books. The thing was they didn't know which books they were assigned. Instructor Aver said when they found the books, they would know. She told them that the library had a way of guiding one to what they seek. At this moment, Zyanna wanted her bed. She was always exhausted after her lessons with Karis. Her sister pushed her to her limit. Karis, on the other hand, never seemed to be the least bit tired. Zyanna knew the difference was because she was human and Karis was elven. Elves had more stamina, more strength. She couldn't help but feel a bit resentful knowing she would never be able to outmatch her sister. 
What book is speaking to you, Zayana? Javid laughed. He clearly thought the assignment was silly. She rolled her eyes. Javid had never taken his study seriously. He was too busy practicing his bow and chasing after the fairer sex. Zayana hated him up until they were in their second level classes. After they were paired up for an assignment, they had been inseparable. I suppose you're too busy looking at Anessa to know which book is calling to you, Zayana teased. You mean she's looking at me, Javi said slyly. Zayana rolled her eyes just as Anessa walked over to them. She was beautiful, but not just in the way elves were beautiful. It was more than that. She had an inner light, a delicate beauty, soft and warm. It was something that Zayana could never obtain, even if she went to the fabled Transfiguration Masters. Anessa had something that could not be re replicated. Good day, Javid, she greeted him, saying nothing to Zayana as if she weren't even there. Good day, my lady, he said respectfully. Anessa was, after all, a part of the royal family. She was very far down the line, but royal nonetheless. Javid, you can call me by my name, Anessa seemed to blush with a slight giggle. Oh, I couldn't do that, my lady. He was laying it on thick, and Zayana nearly burst out laughing, but recovered by playing it off as a sneeze. It's awfully dusty in here, my lady. Zayana said when Anessa looked at her. Excuse me. Yes, well, I haven't noticed. She, her smile was strained. Zayana wasn't surprised. Elves didn't seem to be affected by mundane things the way she did. Every winter, Zayana became ill, and only her. She spent at least a week in bed with a high fever, and every spring she would stay with a headache and sneezing for the first few days of the fresh blooms. Anessa had turned to talk to Javid again. Zayana wasn't really paying attention and moved her way down the rows of books. Soon she found herself far away from her classmates and in a part of the library she had never been to before. Can I help you find something? A voice said to her. Zayana jumped and turned to face one of the library staff. She was a much, much older elf. It was always hard to tell because once an elf reached maturity, their aging process slows down. An elf could be over 100 and still look 35 in human years. Still, she was clearly older, a face, a map of lines in her, her face a map of lines and her blue eyes a bit hazy with age. She even walked a bit slow and with a slight limp. Zayana supposed this was proof that even elves finally had to face the signs of time and age. Still, there was a liveliness to her eyes. They were dark, not like the ice blue eyes she was used to seeing. It was welcoming and refreshing. No. Thank you, Zayana finally said. I'm supposed to um, let the book find me? Oh, yes, the old elf smiled. Instructor Avra enjoys this assignment. It gets you young elves out from under her for a moment. She must have lost her good eyesight as well, Zayana thought. I'm not an elf, Zayana told her. I'm human. Oh, my eyes are not what they once were, but I can normally tell one from the way they carry themselves, she told her. If you are indeed human, then you are the daughter of Dorthran and Ira. I am pleased to meet you. I am Mavgik. It's a pleasure, instructor, I t she told her. Oh, we are both mistaken today, my dear, she smiled. I am no instructor, just an old lady who enjoys helping. Zayana smiled. She liked Mavic. It was rare meeting an elf who didn't gawk at her for being human. She also noticed that Mavic had called her the daughter of Dorthran and Ira, just daughter, not human daughter, not adoptive daughter, just daughter. It was nice to meet you, Zayana, Mavic told her. I've always found this part of the library to be the one place that has what I'm looking for. She sort of waved her hand to the row of shelves right down from them. Zayana smiled and then turned in that direction. Mavic, besides Javid, was one of the only elves she had ever met that made her feel welcome. Oh, we, oh, excuse me. She was Dothran's daughter, so there was a sense of protection that came with that. However, there were those who didn't, care her, who her father was and they let her know it they had been there had been many times she was denied entry to a shop or spat at as she passed someone in the street the humans and elves had a long history of bad blood Zayana learned there really were no innocent parties involved in their feud but it was universally known who had spilled the first drop of blood and it wasn't the elves a long time ago well before she was born humans came to the land of Mirstone. They sailed here on large ships from a distant land. They were hardened and cold beings who were determined to take uproot wherever they chose. Unfortunately, they chose Vokish. The humans were accustomed to taking everything they pleased with little repercussions. They were not prepared for the power of the elves. Many of them were killed in a war that didn't last that long. 
After all, how could humans face off against the elves of Bakesh? It was known as the War of Hours, for that is all it lasted. When the human armies were decimated, their king surrendered to the elven king of Bakesh. The elves were benevolent beings, even if they defended their land without mercy. They allowed the small group of humans that were left to stay and even gave them a small portion of their land. Humans are prideful and vengeful, however. There have been times since that day that small bands of them have tried their hand at raiding elven villages or stealing from their outposts. Sometimes they may make off with a few coins or trinkets, but for the most part, they are stopped, tried, and punished by elven law. However, for the most part, humans had made a thriving city in the land that was given to them. They have their own ruling class, schools, libraries, and more. They lived a quiet existence and often traded with the elven and dwarven communities. There were towns and clans that had broken off from the main city of Hellsford. Some were nomadic, living off the land and never letting go of their ancestors' tendencies of pillaging and taking what they wanted. Diana's family was part of one of those tribes. When the clan moved close to the base of the dwarven mountains of Rashdell, they thought they could sneak in and steal some of the jewels that had been mined. On their mission, they came across a band of elven riders who were in the midst of trading with the dwarves. The human thought this, was, this must have been their lucky night. Not only could they steal from the dwarves, but they could take the elves' horses, for there were no finer breeds in the land. To their peril, they were wrong. Assuming they could raid the elven party while they slipped, slitting their throats as they were unconscious, they snuck in and were instantly caught. A fight broke out and the humans were killed. After the dust settled, the only humans alive were a woman and a small child. She had been carrying the baby on her back. The woman was mortally wounded and so close to death that she clung to her infant. Please, she had said to Dorthrin, she does not deserve to die out here. Take her. Help her. Dorthrin had told Zyanna the story many times. He had told her that she was the most beautiful baby he had ever seen, with a head full of red hair and skin like the fertile soil. That was what Dorthrin had done. He and his wife, Ira, had already had Karis when he brought Zyanna into their home. Both of her parents loved her, but she had asked many times why they had not given her to the humans in Hillsford. How could I, her father had said, I had already fallen in love with you. She knew his words were true, but there was more to it than that. Having a human child living amongst them was somewhat of an advantage. The humans of Hellsford knew of her existence. They knew she had been spared. It was the elves' way of showing the humans that yes, they could end their lives in a blink of an eye, or they could spare them. In other words, the humans were at their mercy. Zyanna often wondered what her parents were like. Would she like them? Would she have even been like them? If they had never raided that camp, would she have grown up a nomadic human and thief? She continued to move along the aisle, running her fingers across the spines of books as she walked. Suddenly, she felt a tingle in her arm. She stopped and looked at the book that had caught her attention. It was a large green leather bound book. There were gold letters that decorated its spine. She pulled it out of the shelf and a surge of electricity ran the length of her arm. The book was large, but she was surprised at the lightness. It was probably some magic the elves used to make their job easier. She found a secluded corner and sat down on the dusty floor, the book in her lap. There were no markings other than the letters on the spine. There were elven letters, one she didn't recognize, that the book didn't look that old. Touching the spine, she sounded out the words. With that combination, the words slowly formed into something she could read. The armor of Dusan, she read out loud. Zyana opened the book, and the strange letters began dancing around the pages at her. They seemed to be moving with some sort of energy. The movement made her eyes hurt as she struggled to focus on them. Whoever had written this book wanted to be sure that only the determined could read it. That made her highly suspicious and curious. Closing her eyes, she steadied herself. Taking a deep breath, she held the book and willed herself to concentrate. If she could read the title, then she could read the rest of it. The title that was bothering her. She had heard that name before, Dusan, but where? She searched her memory, but nothing came to mind. After a few more minutes, she opened her eyes, and to her surprise and relief, the words were a bit calmer. They moved, but it was more of a vibration. As she began to read, the words slowly started to form and make sense to her. By the time she was finished, Zyanna couldn't breathe. She stood up, the book still clutched in her hands. 
There were footsteps in the distance, and she faintly heard a voice. It was Javid. He touched her shoulders, and she bolted, running from him and what she had read. Javid called after her, but she didn't stop. Ziana ran and ran. She needed air. The problem was she was on the fifth level, and she either had to run down all of those stairs to the courtyard or go up to try and reach the roof, which was just as many floors, if not more, up. Not wanting to push to pass her instructor, she entered a place she was never supposed to go, the librarian's offices. Zyanna, she heard a voice, but still didn't turn around. She continued to run. The offices were empty. The librarians were out on the floor helping their students and patrons. She vaguely took in the fact that she was running down a long stone hallway with doors here and there. There was sunlight coming from the end of the hall and that was her goal. She didn't know if it were a window or if it would even open, but she needed to try. She had to breathe. At last, she finally reached the source of light and realized it was a door. Bursting through, she found herself on a terrace, a large balcony covered with all sorts of vegetation and small birds. Finding a weeping willow in the center, she ran to the sturdy tree and clung to it, taking in a large, deep breath. Zayana Javid came to her side, but didn't touch her. You're scaring me. What is the matter? Zayana said nothing, but she handed him the book as she continued to try and control her breathing. Javid gently took the large bound book from her, and she couldn't help but think of all the trouble she had just gotten herself into. First, she had read a book from a section of the library she was not permitted to enter. Then she took a book without permission, and now she was in a location she clearly wasn't allowed to be in. I don't understand, Javid said. Why has this book upset you? What language is this? I can't even read it. She turned to face him, shocked. You can't read it? No, he said, then looked at her. Can you? I can, she said, almost fearfully. The book is called The Armor of Dusan. Who is Dusan? Javid looked at the book again. He is, for the first time, Zaina could feel tears fall from her eyes. Javid finally got down on his knees in front of her and touched her face. He pulled her close to him, comforting her. What he didn't know was that there was nothing at that moment that could take away the pain and betrayal she felt. Zaina, please don't cry, he said, releasing her and wiping away her tears. Tell me what is the matter. I have been lied to, Javid, she told him, tears falling down her cheeks. I have been betrayed. How? What happened? He looked concerned. This book, she took it from him. It tells the story of, the story of Dusan. He was an elven knight who was promised to the princess of Alkesh. To prove his worth, he was sent on a quest to slay the dragon of the Ash Mountains that was terrorizing a neighboring town. He slew the beast, but was horribly wounded in the process. The village that was being terrorized was occupied by humans. A kind villager found him and took him to the village healer. There, the healer and the healer's daughter, Ithine, nursed him back to health. During that time, Dusan fell in love with her. He wanted to marry her. When he, when he healed, a local priest wed them. Afterward, he took her and a section of Dragonhide back to Valkesh. He expected his father to welcome him and his new bride. His father was furious. You see, if an elf marries a human, if they decide to bond their lives with a human, they give up their immortality. He ordered Ethan to be banished from the kingdom and the marriage annulled by the elven wizards. When Dusan refused, his father ordered the execution of Ethi. Seeing no other way, Dusan rescued her and fled across Mirstone, hoping to find shelter somewhere. For a few months, they did, hiding in the Feywilds. While there, Ethi gave birth to a daughter. Their happiness was not to last, for the king's guards found them. Dusan was not going to give up his wife and child easily. He fought, begging for Ethi to run. She tried, but was struck down by none other than his own father. Dusan was mortally wounded and was thought dead after throwing himself off a cliff. His father returned to the fallen body of Ethi and saw that the infant was still alive. He drew his sword because he could not allow a half-blooded child to live. Dusan's father, however, was turned to kindness when he saw her face and took her as his own. His father was Dorthrin. That child was me. Zyanna, Javi didn't know what to say. Are you... Are you sure? I am, she said. It is all here. This book contains the history of my f of Dorthrin's house. But why is the book here? How did you find it? He wondered. Why would your father lie to you about this? Who would leave a written account of what happened? I don't know, she confessed. It happened rather oddly. It read more like a legal account of what happened. I think it's a copy of that account. It looks as though it is a royal document, but they have been spelled so 
not just anyone can read them. Someone wanted this account kept secret, but someone else also wanted it known. She told him about the strange woman and the way the words didn't seem to want to focus from her. David opened the book and looked at the words. Finally, Zaina stood up and walked toward the stone railing of the terrace. She took in a deep, shaky breath. There were many emotions fighting for dominance inside her. If she were being honest with herself, betrayal was winning. She had always known that Dorothryn was not her father, but she never knew who he truly was to her. What happened to him? Javid skimmed through the pages. What happened to, Do to Dusan? You said they thought he was dead. He made his way back to the town. He had met Ethi and found her father, Zayana told him. Both were filled with such anger and pain that they sought out a witch. Dusan combined his remaining elven powers and her magic and made a suit of armor from the dragon scales of the beast he had slain. The suit was given to Dusan, had, was given to Dasan with unimaginable power. Was, Javid wondered. Yes, she continued. The witch's magic was dark. In order for her spell to work, there had to be a blood sacrifice. Dusan had to kill the one person in the world he loved the most, though he did not know this at the time. He put on the armor, marched back to Valkash, determined to slay his father and lay waste to the kingdom. After all, he believed his wife and child were dead. The person who he had loved the most was his father. However, upon fighting his way through an army of guards, he found his father with a child, a child he knew to be his and not because of her fiery red hair. It was because the armor wanted her life, her soul. The only way to complete the spell and gain the full power of the armor was to kill his infant daughter. He wanted to do it, but somehow he overpowered the armor and resisted. Pleading for help, his father had the mages of the city encase the sun and magic in the Ash Mountains. According to that book, he's still there. He's still alive, Javid wondered. I don't know, she turned to him, but I'm going to find out. Wait, what do you mean? He followed after her as she pushed herself from the ledge and headed back to the door. I'm going to find him, she said. You're going to find the man who asked to be in case of magic so he wouldn't kill you? Javid stepped in front of her. You do know how insane that sounds, right? He is my father, Zion had told him. I have to. No, you have to stay alive, he argued. And how do you suppose you're going to find him? The Ash Mountains go for miles in every direction. Did you not see the map in the back? She asked him, opening the book. No, I see only gibberish in that book. He looked frustrated at the thought. It says here that he is at the base of the dragon's eye, Zina told him. Isn't there a dragon statue there, one that we all call dragon's eye? That must be where he is. I must go. I have to. Or you could stay here, he offered. David, she sighed, rubbing her eyes. You don't understand. How could you? You're just as strong, just as fast, just as beautiful as the rest of them with your long life ahead of you. You don't know what it's like to be me. Eventually, once you reach an age, you will stop aging probably Mary and Nessa, and find a place amongst the royals. You will forget me. Sianna, he grabbed her shoulders. I will never, never forget you. You must know what you mean to me. It won't matter when I'm old or dead and you still look like this, she gestured to him. David, you are my friend. I adore you, but in reality, one day we will not be together. If I can find my father, then maybe I can help him and I won't be alone. She could tell that Javid wanted to say something, but she walked away, leaving the words unspoken. Hearing his footsteps behind her, they entered the library. Now that she was a bit calmer, she realized exactly where they were, and her nerves started to eat at her. They snuck down the hall, trying their best to be as quiet as possible. For Javid, it was, the, it was second nature to be stealthy. For her, she had to try with all her might. She couldn't help but wonder why that was. If her father was an elf from a talented family and was also a king's guard, how had she not inherited his abilities? Was it possible she had? Her sister believed her skills had increased in a way that wasn't humanly possible. Zyana was almost sure that with a bit more practice, she could finally beat Karis. She would be of age soon, even before Javid. She explained her thoughts to him, and he seemed to think she might be onto something. Besides, if Zofra had noticed a difference, Perhaps it was true. As they finally made it back to the, made their way back to the library stacks, Zaina relaxed slightly. Not enough, though. Her stomach was still in knots. Her shoulders felt tense, and a headache was forming at the base of her neck. She knew that she would never truly feel the same again. She had to find her father. With that thought, she raised her skirt hem until she reached the tight white undergarment she was made to wear. Javid's face went red, and he turned. What are you thinking? Javid whispered. 
I have to hide this book, she told him. He peeked back around and saw that she had slipped the tights off and was now using them to strap the book to her inner thigh. You have gone mad, he told her. Perhaps, she said, not really paying attention to what he was saying. Keep a lookout for me, will you? He turned and looked down the aisle, and when it seemed like she was done, he turned back to face her. I love you, Zyanna, he told her. I love you too, she told him. You know that. You are my best friend. That is why I need you to understand why I'm doing this. Put yourself in my place, Javi. If he can be saved, I have to try. He looked at her for a moment. There was something in his eyes, something in the way he clenched his jaw. For a moment, it made her feel uncomfortable. They had been friends for so long, but he had never looked at her like that. I am going with you, he said at last. You are not to argue with me. You said to put myself in your place, and I am. I understand. Now put yourself in mine. Would you let me go alone? No, she admitted. Besides, he told her, I know ways in and out of here that you do not. We can leave this evening. How do you never mind? Zana rolled her eyes. All of your rendezvous, right? You think so little of me. He smiled down at her. I know you, she said. I wonder about that sometimes. He looked serious again, and once more she saw that look in his sky blue eyes. Come, we must at least pretend that we're not going to sneak out after nightfall and go on a quest that will kill us both. Um, I'm not sure where my time is. but <laughs> You're good. Um, okay. You can stop there if you want. Sure. That's a lot. <laughs> it is a lot. <laughs> but... To be fair, and for those yes. who have not read the anthology, um, most of the stories fell between seven to ten thousand words, um, which is a, a, a typical short story, I think. And but Amanda wrote twenty-two thousand word story for me, so uh, that's why I said she wouldn't read the whole thing because yeah, um, if you listen to my audiobooks on here, most of those are around three to four hours and those are all 20 to thirty thousand words so we'd be here for a while if she read the whole thing yeah uh, <laughs> and i keep uh, messing up so we'd be here even longer <laughs> yeah I, I do the same thing when i do my readings with um with pd max so it's, it's yeah it is it's like a little bit of tongue tied we're, we're not pro narrators you know so no definitely not <laughs> only write them um, <laughs> but I love this story because what you think is happening is isn't necessarily what's really happening. And as yeah. things <laughs> unfold, and especially at the end, you're like, what? Oh, my God. <laughs> like, that was not what I was expecting. So uh, I, I, I love this story because it was so, so good at making you think one thing. And then when you realized it was completely different, it was like, a mind-blowing moment so oh thank uh, you oh yeah I, I loved it so for those of you who um you know prefer the audio stuff uh you you'll probably want to check the ebook out for this because um i don't think we'll ever put these in professional narrated form so um i just don't think there's uh the cost is you know they're yeah. kind of short stories and stuff but um but yeah, it's a great story. And there's other great stories in that anthology too. Um, and there's two of them. This one, um, The Arm of Dusan is in Magic of Mirstone. And all of the stories in that anthology focus around uh, magical items or um, magic in general. Uh, most of them are magic items. So um, you'll want to check them all out. But yeah, hers is very, uh, it's very, very good. So Thank um, you. I'm, I'm glad <laughs> that you <laughs> had something to contribute um, because I knew you said you had loved fantasy and so it was awesome yes. to bring you on board and, and have a story. In and I got to work with you because you know I love your books. So um, you. I, I enjoy your writing so, so much. And I'll, I tell everyone when they're like, I'm looking for a new fantasy author. You're the first person that I recommend because I, know, yeah. I just... You're always tagging me on TikTok, and I appreciate <laughs> I <am>. it. <laughs> I am. I just love, love, love your stories, and I can't wait to get into the rest of them because I know I've only I'm only on one series, and I know you have multiple, <laughs> so I can't wait yeah. to make my way through them. So, um, yeah, I just I know I'm, and I know I'm gonna love this as much as as all of the others. So, thank you. <laughs> You're, You're welcome. Kind.
<laughs> oh, no, it's true, though. It's true. Because, you know, as a writer, you know, you have very limited time to read. So you have to read what you really, really enjoy. So I'm one of those people that can DNF a book real fast. I'm like, nope, I'm not enjoying this. I'm done, you know? <laughs> and I didn't used to be that way. <laughs> right, yeah. But now that I don't have a lot of time, I'm like, nope, I'm done. And yours, your books are one of those books that I'm like, no, I'm, I'm finishing this book. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I appreciate that. Of course. <clears throat> All right, well, um, like I said, the anthology link will be in the description um, and I'll put Amanda's information in there as well. She writes under the name A.G. Porter. So, uh, but I will put her website, Amazon author page, all that stuff. And you can find her books there. And uh, if you like paranormal, um, you know, young adult paranormal stuff, you can definitely check her stuff out. Um, is all of your stuff on Kindle Unlimited or? Uh, it is, yeah. Okay. So if you have Kindle Unlimited, you can read for free. So um, be sure to, you know, look up her profile and, and give her books some love. Yep. And, and I do have audiobook for The Sacrifice of Ava Black. That is out right. of audiobook. Yep. So, yeah. So, um, and yeah, so that's a, out there as well. I'll put, I'll put a mm -hmm. link in there too. So um, you'll have all of her information that you can look up her stuff and, and give her some love on her books. So. <laughs> 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 I well, thank it. you thank you for joining me and uh we'll uh thank you call it a video <laughs> okay <laughs> see ya bye